I'm Fazri Abdul Rashid, but you probably know me as Faka Faz. I make a living telling jokes, and at the same time, I'm trying really hard not to become one. I work my way to the top, alright? I may not have O levels, but I have a Netflix special, alright? You must be wondering, what's a jester like me doing hosting a show on CNA? Let me explain. I've built my entire career on the internet. It's helped me promote myself and gain a following. So we're going to talk about cyber security. But I'm a slave to the digital world. Without my website or my social media platforms, I'll be lost. Which got me thinking. All my data is online. What if I got hacked? I don't want to get punked by some hoodie-wearing hacker with a taste for a comedian's private information. I'm not the only person with high stakes in today's tech-dependent world. We are all at risk of losing our data, our privacy, even our hard-earned money. I want to learn more. Who's behind our cyber security? What are they doing to keep us safe? And who are these hackers anyway? Can we stop them? How? Is there anything I can do on my own? What? Why do I have so many questions? I need answers now. What's up, guys? Yes. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you guys here. Yeah. Uh, we are here for one reason. It's because everybody here got hacked before. My account was hacked in total of four times. Four times? Four times, and I just made a new account. After three months, disappear again. I got an email from a Russian country. It said that if you wanted your account back, you got to pay me $300, like USD. I was having lunch with my friend, mm -hmm. and then uh, Jeff just called me and said, hey, I think your Instagram has been hacked. I was like, are you serious? So I got my sister to like um, check lah, my, my uh, Twitter handle, and it was just another face. Aisha, it's still Aisha this, but it was another girl's face. So I figured out that it was more of a personal attack uh, because of how they had my number mm -hmm. and, and put false information of me out there. We even make a police report because we might worry the hacker will cheat uh, our followers' money. So we just go on live mm -hmm. and then we even shoot a video to ask all our followers to uh, unfollow me. Mm -hmm. So my friends suggest me that, okay, why don't you message your own Instagram account by oh. using Jeff's account? So I tried, so he did reply. So he was asking, like, are you sure you are the owner? I was like, damn angry. <laughs> so I was like, yes, I'm the owner. So can you give me back my account? Then he was like, okay, Ken, why don't you give me your password? I'm not going to give you my password. Then he just told me, oh, then good day to you. We will delete your account in two hours. Oh, man. So I have 789 posts in my Instagram account. In just 10 minutes, when I refresh, everything turns to zero. How has that changed the way you approach your social media now? Definitely more paranoid. That being said, I change my password all mm -hmm. the time now. So what do you guys think is in the minds of these hackers when they do these things? Right? Like, if you put yourselves in their shoes, what do you think is their whole motive and intention? The only way we'll find out why hackers hack in the first place is to meet one in the flesh and ask him. In August 2019, a Singaporean by the name of Devesh Logendran competed in the 45th World Skills Competition in Kazan, Russia. Devesh is by definition a white hat, a hacker who uses his skill for good. In essence, he breaks into systems and networks to test their security. The bronze medal goes to Devesh Logendran, Singapore. 
But before the witch donned that ethical headgear, he found Infamy as a major prankster. The witch hacked into the official Twitter account of America's National Football League and sent out a hoax tweet stating that the league's commissioner, Roger Goodell, had died. So what compelled you to hack into the NFL Twitter accounts? Curiosity and, I guess, attention. Because at the time, I was running around with, uh, you know, a few other similar-minded people like me. It was always like a competition to see who, who could escalate and cause the most ruckus. Okay, so Dave, tell us step by step on how you managed to pull all of that off. It first really started off when I discovered a LinkedIn page uh, belonging to the director of social media <laughs> for the account. And I um, started to do research on this person. One thing that um, sites do, uh, websites such as Twitter and Facebook, if yeah. you attempt to reset the password of your account, it will give you a masked version of the email address mm -hmm. so that you can confirm whether um, that's the email yeah. address that's tied to your account. Yeah. So they will obscure the middle part, mm -hmm. but the number of characters will be the same. Mm -hmm. So if you know enough about the person, you can kind of guess wow. the full email. Okay, okay. I was able to reconstruct the full email that way. Uh -huh. And then once you Google that email address, it, it leads to a lot more search results where you can pull out things like uh, address, phone number, that sort of thing, all sorts of information about a person. Okay, okay. So through that, I found the phone number and my goal at that point was to get access to the phone account of that person, the okay. social media director. How can I help you, sir? So I said I'd lost access to my account and I want that access back. So the telco, when they hear this, they have a security procedure, they have to verify who you are. So the first thing they asked me was, What is your PIN? I said, I don't know my PIN. And the second thing they asked is, What's your pet's name? Mm. So I instantly so I instantly went back to them. I, I'd done all this background research, so I know this I knew these person's um, social media. Mm -hmm. So I started searching for any references to a pet, like a dog or a cat. And I and I found a name. Here's your new password, you can log in, log in at this link. That was so easy. Yeah. yeah. Bro, stress, bro. So the entire thing took maybe around an hour. Where was the flaw that led to your success in hacking it? I'd say the main flaw is the telco's method of securing their customers' access. Uh, because in this case, the thing that was uh, stepping between me and uh, complete uh, access was a security question. And one that is easily researched is that, what is the name of your pet? What is the name of your high school mascot? Yeah. These are things where that any, any, anyone who can connect the dots um, yeah. can easily figure out uh, yeah. these things. What are your future plans? There are certain schemes nowadays for national uh, national servicemen to uh, spend in national service mm -hmm. uh, doing cyber uh, cyber security related activities, um, be it, be it like defense to do to protect the nation. Uh, yes, protect online. the nation. Yes, <laughs> online. Yeah. What kind of advice would you give the layman on how to keep their identity and their information safe? Password security is one big thing that everyone uh, everyone has missteps in. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people tend to commit the cardinal sin of reusing passwords across websites. Way back in the Middle Ages, passwords were used to grant access to a fort or castle to only the privileged person. It was simple, effective, and yet extremely vulnerable. All it took was for a stranger with ill intent to overhear the password and suddenly the fort would be vulnerable. It's no different today, where your password is a critical element to your information security. Think of all our personal information housed in several different castles in the land. Would you have a single key that would give you access to your home, office, car and safe? Of course not. Brian, tell me, what are the origins of passwords? So passwords originally came from the old days of spying. So when you were going to meet a contact, you didn't necessarily know who they were. So you would have something to say, like the eagle lands at midnight, and then your contact would say something back, which would be... Yes, it does. You're, you're obviously not my contact. Nope, I'm not, <laughs> yeah. Are my accounts really safe if anyone can reset my password just by knowing the name of my pet? Something seems wrong with the verification process. Our passwords are not only key to our accounts, knowledge of the right password also proves who we are. Brian Fletcher, a cybersecurity executive with 20 years of experience, tries his best to help me understand. 
when we're logging on to a social media account, we're effectively uh, authenticating ourselves. We're proving that it's us trying to access the account online. So generally, when we think of authentication, there's three different ways that we can do it. It's, uh, by providing something that we know, by providing something that we have, or something that we are. Something that we know could be a password or a pin code, or even remembering a particular picture, or a pattern that our finger makes, or something like that. It's a secret that we know that no one else should know. Something that we have would be like a physical token that the bank gives us, or even our phones can provide something that we have. No one else has that, so by proving that I have it, I prove that it's me. And something that we are could be something like our fingerprint, something that's unique to us, or even a picture of our face. Um, that. You know, no one else can be that, and so it proves that it's me trying to log on. So it sounds like all the means of authentication can be hacked into, so our accounts are never 100% safe. Is there a better way to secure these accounts? Well, each of the individual ways of securing an account have their weaknesses, but what you can do is actually build them up, use more than one at a time. It's called two-factor authentication. So you could use a password and a fingerprint, or a password uh, and, and a physical token. So all of the major social media accounts uh, use two-factor authentication if you turn it on. So Facebook, uh, or the Googles, Microsoft, Instagram, you can put two-factor authentication on all of them. So since you recommend using different passwords for every social media account or every account that I have online, how do I remember these passwords? Yeah, it's becoming increasingly difficult in today's modern world to remember all the passwords that we need. Uh, what I recommend to people is that they use a password manager that allows them to use passwords as long or as complex as they want, and they don't have to remember them themselves. Have you ever been hacked? I have not. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, certainly, people have tried, <laughs> but that's life on the internet these days. I'm here in Estonia to meet Dr. Adrian Venables, a security researcher at the Tallinn University of Technology. For an experiment, Adrian and his mischievous cybersecurity students have set a trap to steal passwords from the university staff. And they've led me a closer look at their mischief. This piece of software is designed to make life easy for the attacker. Um, you can use it to copy websites. So just by using this tool, you can copy this website? Exactly. Martin will now demonstrate how he sets up the attack. Well, let's go to the menu for the website attack. Here, as you can see, we can like uh, set the option for traditional harvester. We are waiting for connection. So uh, when the victim connects to the server, mm -hmm. you can see his response. And here it is. So the username, this is like Nikita, and you mm. can see his password. And once we actually shut down this uh, tool, mm -hmm. you can all see the report of all the usernames and passwords. So we are basically harvesting all these credentials. Right. So it shows up here when he keys in. So then you already have this, which you can use to access. Exactly. The rest of his uh, we, yeah accounts. Report is generated automatically. So. That's even better, even easier life for hacker. What these guys just showed me was the start of a phishing attack. I have to admit, it was cool to see how it works, but it was, after all, just an experiment. I really doubt the password on screen we saw is an actual password. So in a real life scenario, how would the user know if they're being phished? What are the signs they should be looking out for? So I've just received an email from an attacker. So he's saying that unless I click this link, um, my employment's going to lapse within two days. Yeah. So when I log in, if I'm educated about phishing, I know that my credentials have now gone to the attacker. Mm -hmm. How would I know if anything is um, genuine or not? So the attacker's taken time to try to spoof some of the genuine emails that we get. So one of the things that you should look at is the domain of the email. Mm -hmm. So this uh, domain is at gmail.com. So you would expect the email to come from at taltech.ee. Okay, okay. So, but a busy user might not see that. And if you 
craft the message in a psychological way um, to produce an instant reaction, a lot of users don't actually check that. Why would someone go through the trouble to do all this? Like, how valuable is my data for a hacker? And depending on the attacker's motives, um, the attacker can use those credentials um, to explore in the system, to gather more detail, can use those credentials to on-sell onto places like the dark webs. It could be financially motivated. It could be other things such as uh, blackmail, revenge. Remember what your parents used to tell you? Never speak to strangers. If you don't reveal information about yourself to strangers in the physical world, then don't do it in the virtual world. Besides, it's hard to see who you are actually talking to when you're sitting behind a computer. So we have to be extra wary not to fall prey to scams like phishing. The term borrows from the idea of a criminal casting a wide net and waiting for the few vulnerable to take the bait. It's cooler sounding cousin, spear phishing, refers to scams that are designed to attack individuals through a mix of social media and social engineering. So if I received an email saying, dear, dear sir, you have won the lottery, that could go to anybody. If it receives an email saying, dear Adrian, then that looks as though it's more tailored to me. Yeah. And then if the email starts to refer to my work at Taltech, of which the adversary would have done that by, under, by looking at my profile at the, where, at the university, it looks more genuine. And so I'm more likely to then click on it because it looks as though it's more tailored, tailored for me. That's what's called spear phishing. Mm. And this is an email that is more tailored and directed to you. There's another type of, of phishing, and that's called whaling. Whaling is in the big way. Whaling, the oh. big fish. Whaling is going for the, the key big, people. Yeah. So whaling would be um, targeted at a, um, a chief financial officer, mm -hmm. a chief executive officer, the people in the company who have, um, who have power. There's also something called schmishing, and smishing? smishing, and that's yeah. using SMS messages. Well, it seems like there's so many forms of attacks, right? Like, like yes. if I don't get yes. attacked by one way, I'll be attacked another way. And there's another one as well, and that's called vishing. vishing. And that is using telephones. So you can receive a phone call and saying, hello, this is your bank here. Um, we've got um, some, some money to transfer to you, just so that we know that it's you. Mm. Can you enter your bank account number? Can you give me an example of a phishing attack that's done on one person that could cause a greater damage to a larger organization? I always say that ultimately phishing always works. If you send out enough phishing emails, someone will click on it. And really the worst thing you can do is if you think you've been infected is to, um, is to pretend and to, to, to ignore it. Think of a company that has got this intellectual property and once it puts this product to market, it will be able to make loads of money. So it could be anything from a self-driving car, an aircraft, a tank. An employee clicks on that phishing email, his credentials are stolen. The adversary then uses these stolen account, these stolen details to access the company's computers. It sees all this research and development, which it steals. So essentially it has all this information for free. So they can bring the product to market cheaper and possibly quicker than the other company. So even if the company still has its information, that data, it produces the product, but find it has a competitor, which is cheaper, which provides exactly the same product. Usually there's a lot of shame attached to it. Like people don't really <coughs> want to come out to tell other people that they've been scammed because it's embarrassing. So it's very important within a, um, an office, office environment, commercial environment, that we're very open and honest and, and accept that the, uh, the adversaries, the criminals who are launching these campaigns, they're very sophisticated. So understanding the threat is, is, is crucial. So people need to um, appreciate that there are criminals out there. Well the, well, the most important thing is what we're doing now. We're yeah. talking about it yeah. and we're raising people's awareness. But there's always more than one way to skin a cat. Catherine is a cybersecurity consultant who also believes in raising awareness and teaching employees how to identify and avoid phishing emails. We're looking for a Tim. But her methods are different. So what we can do is to put them, uh, the employees through a program where we actually fish the user, mm -hmm. 
train them to identify uh, phishing emails. So for the next two weeks, we'll be running the phishing simulation where okay. we actually randomly send out the phishing emails okay. to your employees. There will be several things that we'll be tracking. We'll be tracking whether they actually open their email, click on the links, download the attachment, okay. whether they fill in any information, mm. and then uh, they gone through visit the training page. After that, we'll share the phishing results. Okay. So let's say if I'm a staff who's not in the management level, right? So I don't have any power in decision making. What would be the point in attacking me? Even if you are low level staff, you do actually correspond with senior management, you mm. correspond with clients, you correspond with vendors. So the hacker can actually understudy mm -hmm. the process and the company operations and craft a more targeted phishing email thereafter. So what happened is that sometimes smaller companies are hacked mm -hmm. and they are used to infiltrate the bigger companies, the government agencies. Oh. So your account was being used to send out phishing emails. Okay, Tim, you guys are a PR and marketing firm. So why the sudden interest in cybersecurity? Because we are now starting to work with bigger brands, bigger companies like the government agencies and financial institutes. So I feel that it's best that uh, we protect our clients at the same time while we work with them. It's time to find the weakest link. Please go easy on them. <laughs> I will, I will. You will? Yeah. For all you know, he's the one that kicks it first. Hey, what? <laughs> Please sabotage his own company. Like, hey, For the simulation to work, we need time. So I will take this opportunity to share with you some of the travels I did for the show which most likely will be edited out. This is me trying to look like I wasn't freezing. Oh, that's me on a bridge in Finland. This was me trying out a new pose. My other attempt at making this pose work. After two weeks of failing to make this pose work... Hello! Hello everybody. I found myself back with Catherine, hoping to see some results. Some of you have actually clicked on the link on the email. So for those who actually click on the link, you were lucky. Things could have been a lot worse. Well, have any of you seen this? Huh? No, no, come on guys, don't lie. You don't have to be ashamed. All you did was jeopardize the company and everybody's well-being. That's all. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so who fell for it? Who? 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 You did. You did. You did. You did open it. <laughs> wow. 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 So nobody fell for it. I read the email, but I didn't open the link. So, so we actually had a tracker that sends us a notification when she actually clicked on the link. Boom. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Facts, baby girl. <laughs> Let's see what you fell for, Nico. Let's see. Let's see what you fell for. Let's oh. see. Hi, Nico. In order for easy access on our site, monthly remarks for our meetings will be consolidated into a PDF document from now on. Wow, this looks legit. Documents will be provided to you through emails as usual. October monthly remarks attached PDF. Does anybody send an email this formal? No. No. <laughs> Let this be a lesson to all you young people. Huh? When you click on links, better look at the link properly. Don't fall for phishing emails. So easy to fall for. Wow! That's, we all should not do this. So Tim, what do you think about this whole exercise? I think it's good. I think it gave us a better insight on what cyber security is about. And I'm also very glad that only just one out of, I think, about 10 of us got fish. La. So mm. I think moving forward is a very good experience for everyone to learn from each other's mistakes and be better tech people. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to meet Dr. Ori Sasson, the founder of S2T, a cyber threat intelligence company that's been providing cyber intelligence solutions to government customers for 15 years. But even as a leader in this field, Ori's accounts still got hacked. Just goes to show, nobody is safe. 
Hi, Apa Machan, bro. How are you? Hey, come, hey. Please come in. So I heard one of your accounts got hacked into. What happened? So this is a bit embarrassing because I think I'm an expert, okay? But then okay. still can I leak, okay? So what happened is when I, uh, some years ago, what I would do is like my own account, like bank account, I use some secret uh, password that only I know, right? Mm -hmm. Then for all the other accounts which I deemed not important, I would use a similar password. I go to some site called bit.ly, bit.ly, which is a URL shortener. So what happened was this thing was hacked, okay? So let's say six years ago. Then after some time, it was available online, especially on Darknet. So somebody found that database and then they use it to hack my Spotify account. So this technique is called credential stuffing, okay? So what okay. it means is I find your password, then I try to use the same password in with the same email in uh, Gmail, in uh, Facebook, but also I can try Spotify, Expedia, Amazon, whatever it is. So the person was actually apparently listening to Latin song. Actually, I still have some, you know, like Latin songs, so I can get more cultural experience, you know. Right. Right, right. Probably that's why your account was hacked, because exactly. you had a good taste in music, Exactly, right? exactly. Right? So how did you find out that there was a breach? What mm -hmm. we can do is to go to a place like uh, uh, haveibeenpawned.com mm -hmm. or uh, Firefox Monitor. We key in the email, right. and then they will tell us about known data breaches where this email appeared in. So what kind of personal information can someone find when you know a data breach okay. happens? So typically what you'll have, the prized data will be email, uh, password, credit card information, sometimes phone mm. number, address. So in the case of this bit.ly, actually what they did is they have the email and the password in mm. clear. Mm. Clear meaning you can really see the password. Yeah. So maybe I'll just show you an example of this. Yeah. So what are you doing now? I'm searching for all the uh, passwords of users using email from Yahoo Com SG. And then what we're gonna do is see what are their emails, okay? So, 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 so this is alphabetical, okay? So wow. you see the kind of stuff. Uh, but by the way, you see this is a bit.ly uh, password. Mm. So this person, for example, the password is bit.ly. So this actually yeah. is a good practice, you know, because even if it's compromised, only that. Uh, this, is, this is IC number. Whew. Every time I interview a new person, I change my password. Good, good practice. Okay. It's not only about changing the password, it's also to be vigilant. I don't want to assume that I'm safe online just because I haven't been hacked yet. What's up? Mr. Dexter, come, come, come. Anti-Hack specializes in auditing IT systems for security vulnerabilities. And I'm meeting their CTO, Dexter, for insight into how big a part vigilance plays in the cyber world. Why do so many people get hacked? They think that, oh, I'm so small, I'm a nobody, why would they hack me? I'm not famous. Yeah. But they don't know that a search engine exists to anything that comes up onto the internet, it will be present here. Any devices that are being connected to the internet and you have an IP address, it will definitely show up on Shodan. This is an right. example of uh, cameras that, that do not have any password and you can even search by country. So let's say US. Yeah. yeah. So you can see all these uh, cameras. Dude, these are things that you see in movies, man. I didn't even know this existed. Guys, they can watch you. They can watch... Just like that, like yeah. anybody can, can can see this. Yes, that's right. What? As long as you didn't put a password, we are also able to find 3D printers. In this panel here, that is not password protected. You are even able to download the schematics of whatever he's printing. Yeah, so you can see here turbo oil drain spacer. You can even upload your own schematic and make him print print your schematics. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. A malicious hacker will actually download this and then sell the same schematics to his competitor. It's like giving a restaurant's recipe to another yes, to a competitor. Right. La, yeah, yeah. To... I mean, it's available online for anybody to download. Shodan is essentially a search engine that gives its users the ability to scan the web for vulnerable devices and systems. Shodan itself does not do anything malicious, and yet it was one time called the scariest search engine on the internet. Is this legal? Yes, this is definitely legal because this was created for cybersecurity researchers to find vulnerable devices and then fix it. Mm. 
unsuspecting people leaving their data and devices unsecured on the internet are just begging for the bad guys to take advantage. But not everyone out there has a corrupt agenda. Bob and Jeremiah are security researchers who actually started as PR men, but are now neck deep in the world of cybersecurity and protecting data leaks, one company at a time. So just imagine uh, your work as a PR guy in a, in a big IT company. And then one day you, you... Long story short, they had a data breach, they ignored it, but of course it snowballed and then the press got involved, which really put them in the spot. So they retraced their steps, contacted the original guy who discovered the breach and tried to learn from him. Oh, not like that though. Definitely not in a dingy car park. Well, I guess it was love at first sight with cybersecurity, because here we are. Except Bob and Jeremiah now reveal data breaches to companies so that incidents like this don't ever happen again. And they do it for free. Is going to somebody else's database to find out who the owner is legal? There is some gray ground and, and generally, you don't want to shoot the messenger. Yeah. You don't want to... A legitimate security researcher who's trying to help you, you don't want to file charges against that person or file a lawsuit because a legitimate security researcher is trying to help you not harm you. They have no ill intent. So tell me, what can a hacker do with this kind of information? He or she can access the data, uh, grab it, sell it later on black market, or completely destroy, drop the database and uh, put a ransom note in there asking for data uh, that would never uh, be returned. Do, do you have an example of how this uh, ransom note looks like? Your DB was saved and archived. You have seven days to restore it. This would make me panic. Send 0.1 Bitcoin uh, to address below. So since all this information is available online, why aren't companies uh, making sure that their data is safe? I think there's a false sense of security with a lot of these companies. They feel that they're doing enough, but what they don't realize is that the threats change every single day. Data today is just as valuable as the products or services that they offer. And companies have an obligation to protect that data. So if, a, if, if you have a data breach and you try to sweep it under the rug, you have an obligation to tell your customers. Bob and Jeremiah have been at the center of several discoveries involving data breaches. They are on a mission to make the cyber world safer, but how would their methods be viewed in Singapore? So I met this security researcher in Ukraine who finds these insecure databases, goes into the database, finds the rightful owner and informs him about the breach, right? So why can't I do that in Singapore? Basically, the law prohibits someone from knowingly gaining access to certain programs or data without authority. So this then brings us to computer-related laws, um, uh, uh, namely the Computer Misuse Act. Singapore's Computer Misuse Act is over 20 pages long, a slow burn, unless you're an avid reader of legislation. But really, all you need to know is that it refers to absolutely any act performed to secure computer material against unauthorized access. Oh, and P.S. When they refer to computer, that includes just about everything with a microchip. But let's liken this to the real world scenario, right? Um, that kind of database being open is a bit like, let's say you live in a landed house. You've got your door and then you've got your gate. Your gate is open. Your door is open, right? Can someone just come in? Well, anybody can physically come in. Doors open! But by coming in, they would actually be trespassing. Yes. Unless you give them consent. Yes. So we also need to apply that similarly in the digital world, right? No security was, 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 was put in place for that database. Well, but it doesn't mean that you can just simply saunter in mm -hmm. and take out that data. Let's say this is not a house. Let's say this is a wallet. I found a wallet on the street and the wallet has the information of the person but I've already opened the wallet and seen the information. All I want to do is just call the person to tell him like, Hey man, I have your wallet. Oh, 
thanks, man. No problem. Appreciate it. Take care of it. I don't think I should go to jail for that, but, but. No, you shouldn't. So that wallet, I would think, I would liken it to, to a situation where you've actually taken an asset out of your own house. Right now, you put it in a public domain. Ah. It's sitting, it's sitting out th down there. So obviously, someone has to do something about it. So likewise, if data has been exfiltrated or taken out from a certain database, right, and then it's been put out there, a good Samaritan that chances upon it while surfing the internet could very well then, okay, I need to find out who it, whose it is, and then after that, reach out to either the police or to the actual organization itself. Okay, okay. So the Computer Misuse Act has provisions in there that does not criminalize that sort of activity. In an era where data has become so valuable, the world of cybersecurity is filled with researchers who are plugging this leaking dam. But even when the security is working, could we be unwittingly revealing our data on any given day? So what laws are there to protect me and my data when I hand over my information to another party? Right. In Singapore, we have the Personal Data Protection Act, uh, PDPA for short. One of the principles is that they need to protect that personal information. Um, so, for example, if you provide them with uh, sensitive personal data, such as your identification number mm -hmm. or, or your biometric data, they've got to protect it to a higher level. So, essentially, when you hand over personal information to an organisation, this organisation would be regulated by the PDPA and they have to deal with that personal data responsibility. So, what does having the PDPA legislation mean for Singapore? It only means positive things for Singapore. Mm -hmm. Firstly, it shows consumers, individuals, residents, um, that indeed Singapore is serious about protecting their personal data. It also cements the fact and supports the fact that um, as a whole, Singapore wants to embrace you know, um, the digital world and wants to become a smart nation. We are definitely running with the idea of being a smart nation but an important aspect of that is protecting the privacy and security of its citizens. Legislation like the PDPA and the Computer Misuse Act are the building blocks to ensure that the final structure stays strong. individuals, many of us have started to adopt the smart lifestyle. But what about countries that have adopted this approach on a much larger scale? Singapore only announced its Smart Nation initiative in 2014. But Estonia had a head start with its own program, pioneering the national digital identity for all its citizens. So the Estonian e-identity is tied, it's connected to a personal code that everyone in Estonia has. The electronic ID in general I use to log into all the different state portals to give digital signatures that are legally binding so I never have to sign a paper contract ever again. Um, the electronic ID is sort of my unique electronic identifier in a digital online forum. You don't have to do anything in person in an office anymore. Oh. Uh, so in Estonia, 99% of government services are online. So why did Estonia decide to go digital? So 1991, Estonia regained independence from the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't have the manpower to staff all the different government offices around the country. It didn't have the money either. Mm -hmm. So the decision to go digital was first made in 1994. What does the EID program have to say about the privacy of the general public? So, with the electronic ID in Estonia, what we have connected is the so-called truth-by-design approach. This means that on the state portal, I can see effectively every single time who has accessed what part of my information, when and why. And this is a lot of transparency that most governments don't really offer. And it creates a lot of trust in return because yes, parts of government can see part of my data as they sometimes have to, mm -hmm. but I see when they do which is what we sometimes call the reverse Big Brother approach. But wouldn't you think um, that there will be more chances of hackers trying to get into the data because it's all digital now? Uh, no. So in 2007, we had a big concerted cyber attack by a nation state that shall not be named, but not a single data set was lost. They tried to deface some of the websites. The Estonian government took some of the servers down as a precautionary measure. 
uh, and some of the servers were slowed down. But Estonia learned from this experience, even though nothing was, nothing was lost or hacked. Uh, it was still a good test for the systems and even stronger security measures have been implemented afterwards. We have thousands of attacks every single day. Uh, what's important is that you make sure that you encrypt your data properly, uh, that the transfers between different government authorities are secure, mm. uh, that you make your databases as secure as possible. Encryption plays a pivotal role in our digital security. I want to know more, but before that, a history lesson. Dr. Stephen Murdoch is a security researcher at University College London. And now, my guide to the world of encryption. During World War II, the Germans would use the Enigma machine to transmit encrypted messages to great effect. For a time, its codes seem unbreakable. But of course, with the help of a certain Alan Turing, we all know that didn't remain the case. So the person who is sending the message, first of all has to put the key into the machine using these three dials. Mm -hmm. And then they push these buttons to enter in the message. The secret key is a sequence of, in this case, three numbers. And if the recipient of the message knows the right set of numbers, they can read the message. And if they don't know the numbers, then the Germans hoped that no one would be able to discover what was being said. So this is the Turing bomb, a reconstruction. Um, this is what the British used to discover the secret key that the Germans were using for sending the, their, these messages. And using that secret key, the British were then able to read the messages that were encrypted using that key. So how did the people who invented this machine figure out the formula of how to decrypt the messages that was done by the Enigma? There was a few mistakes made when people designed Enigma and also when the operators used Enigma and those mistakes were exploited to be able to build a machine that would run through lots of possibilities and then once it found the right possibility, it would discover that key. Then that key was used for decrypting many messages that all used that same key. So what is the difference between encryption that's done by these machines and modern day encryption? So with Enigma, one of the big challenges was how do you get that initial secret key over to the recipient of the message. So they had code books, the code books were stolen. It was very expensive and insecure. Um, for modern encryption, you don't need to have these code books moving around. A anyone can just have one certificate and then distribute that certificate to anyone they, they want to be able to send the messages. And in practice, software handles all of that without the sender of the message being aware. Encryption is a way of scrambling data so that only authorized parties can understand the information. Take, for example, a famous form of encryption, Caesar's cipher. Julius Caesar would use the simple technique of substituting each letter with a letter some fixed number of positions along the alphabet. For example, with a left shift of three, the letter F would become C. He would use this cipher to communicate messages of political or military importance. In this day and age, this basic form of encryption would hold no security. Instead, modern-day encryption uses algorithms to encrypt data and then uses a key for the receiving party to unscramble the information. Cybersecurity isn't the most accessible subject but sometimes a lesson or two does make a difference, especially when I don't even have to be in a classroom. Welcome up onto the IMDA Lab on Wheels bus, okay? This bus specifically is a cybersecurity bus, where we teach you a bit more about cybersecurity and how to protect you to be online. Can anyone share with me what do you think you know about cybersecurity? Ah, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yes, ooh. bus. Cybersecurity is a uh putting a very strong password so nobody can uh, guess it. That's right. Scams. Scams, very good. What else? Sure. Hackers, that's right. Sure. It's the youth that will benefit the most from this education. They are, after all, going to be on the front line in the future. But for today, we are all vulnerable to the risks and we all need to get on board with the idea of educating ourselves about cybersecurity. Man, 
Did you notice something about the emails? <laughs> why are there two emails that says ask you to change your password? Can you all think why? Exactly. So someone is trying to fish us. Exactly. All right. I was about to say the same, but you know, mm -hmm. good try. Okay. Right. Cool. cool. All right. So <laughs> one of them is actually a fake email, which is a mm. malicious one, and another one is actually correct. You need to decipher out which is the correct email. Oh no! <laughs> oh no, Gary! You actually chose the phishing email, which has actually got scammed. So your password actually has been phished by the it, hacker. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, I'm so stressed. Lab on Wheels is part of IMDA's digital readiness efforts to familiarize people with emerging technology such as AI, immersive media, and cybersecurity. As we move towards a digital nation, you know, a smart nation, a smart city, increasingly people need to be aware that all their actions could actually lead to some damage that they do to themselves or to their companies. So is it very easy for you to get this message across to people who are not technologically savvy? We've had grandmothers up on board. It's, you know, it's very interactive. It's very hands-on. Mm -hmm. And through the activities that itself, they kind of realise they could be the weakest link. You know, it's something that they've done or they haven't done, and that could lead to a bigger attack. Um, and I think that's how all cybersecurity attacks start. So they realise that, you know, um, digital threats come in many different forms. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, that's, that's the greatest reward for us, to make them a little bit more aware mm. and to uh, be a little bit more careful. While filming this episode, I've changed my password about five times and I now reread all the emails I receive thinking they're fake. I have met lawyers and security researchers who have tried their very best to educate me on cybersecurity and how we need to keep safe. But I can't help thinking that behind the noise and jargon, we still need to take a human approach to our cybersecurity. We are mere individuals, but online, we make up an infinite network which needs to be kept safe. Let's not risk our privacy and our data. Let's not get cyberpunked. <laughs>